So today, I'm going to walk us through part two of Vexed. I personally am one that believes that a person can be demon-possessed, but I don't know that I've ever known a person demon-possessed. I have known many people that's vexed, but I don't know of anybody that I have ever personally known that I would say was demon-possessed. Uh, to be possessed means that there's someone that's just moved into someone's body, a, a spirit has moved into someone's body and took them over com completely, and everything that they are and everything that they do is controlled by the devil, and I've never met anybody like that. There may be people like that that's insane or something like that, but I've never, as far as I know, ever met anybody that I would say was demon-possessed, but I've met many that I would say is vexed. So as I deal in this subject, I'm not going to be dealing with telling stories about demon possession. I've got some I could tell you, and they're really good ones, but I'm not going to tell you because I don't want to deal in the sensational. I'm only going to deal with things that I can prove. I want you to know, you might say, well, Brother Kilpatrick, isn't it risky you preaching on something like this? No, it really isn't. It, it's something that I haven't dealt with, but it's not uncomfortable really for me. It's something that I feel like needs to be dealt with. I'm not doing it to try to be different. I was somewhere by myself several weeks ago, and I heard the Holy Spirit say to me in my spirit, he said, you know there's an escalation of demonic activity, don't you? And I said, oh, Lord, that's evident. He said, look at suicides. They're rampant. Look at depression. It's rampant. And look at violence. It's rampant. And he said, <clears throat> I want you to speak on this. I said, yes, absolutely, I will, Lord. So that's how I developed this series, and I'm still developing it. It's going to be about eight weeks to maybe 15 weeks. <laughs> it's going to be eight weeks. I feel pretty sure it's going to be about eight weeks long. I'm going to be dealing with a lot of different things. Now, there's going to be a lot of things that you may want me to deal with that I didn't deal with, but I'm not trying not to deal with it on purpose. I'm only going to deal with things that I feel like I need to say and I can prove by the scriptures and can make it understandable for you that when you leave this building, you can take it away and share it with your friends and your family. Because here's what I'm saying to you in no uncertain terms. You need to be prepared for increased demonic activity. And if you don't believe in it, you got a rude awakening coming. And uh, I'm not afraid to deal with it. You don't need to be afraid to hear it. And we need to stop denying it and acting like it's not there. It's there. And it's going to be in your face real soon. So with that said, I'm going to read my scripture and we're going to preach. So I want you to stand with me, please. I'm going to read from Acts chapter number 5 and verse 16. There came also a multitude of the towns and the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were waxed, or vexed rather, with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. I'm going to go to Mark in just a few minutes, chapter 1, and I'm going to spend a good bit of time in Acts, uh, Mark chapter 1. The thing that I'm going to do today is I'm going to sort of introduce us to the way Jesus dealt with demons. We're going to look at how he dealt with them. And he was casual the way he dealt with them. And we need to be casual also and not get all worked up and fearful. Deal with them casually. Because he said, I give you authority over all the works of the devil. So if you have authority over something, you don't have to work it up. And you don't have to scream and yell. Amen. Just be casual about it and get the job done. But uh, I want to deal with how he dealt with it. And um, before the next the next weeks after today, the next weeks, I'm going to break down everything that the Bible calls a spirit. Only the things that the Bible calls a spirit. And there's 14 of them. And under each spirit, each strong man's spirit, 
there's a list of symptoms under each spirit. And it segues into all kinds of things that involve humanity. You want to hear it? I'm going to deal with the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of bondage, deaf and dumb spirit, the spirit of uh, divination, the spirit of error and a lying spirit, a familiar spirit, spirit of fear, spirit of haughtiness, spirit of heaviness, spirit of infirmity, spirit of jealousy, perverse spirit, seducing spirit, and spirit of whoredom. I'm going to deal with all 14 of them. And I'm going to try to deal with two or three a week, and I'm going to have listed under each spirit all kinds of symptoms. Well, let me tell you how the devil's smart and how we're going to have to be savvy. A lot of times when someone goes to deal with someone that's, that's vexed of a devil, Satan gets people sidetracked on the symptom and the spirit stays in charge. And we, get, we see the symptoms that's manifesting and we're trying to cast out symptoms. Jesus cast out the spirit that was responsible for all the symptoms. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with it extensively. I just named you 14 spirits. I'm going to try to cover about three a week. I may cover more than that some weeks, and I may cover less than that some weeks. But it's really interesting what we're going to be dealing with because, I mean, it, it really is um, it's an eye-opener once you see all this stuff. So we're going to get right into it right now, and I want you to be seated. I want you to give me your best ear. And Lord, we just speak peace over this congregation. I speak peace now over the homes, Lord, of the people listening. I speak that there not be intrusions, interruptions, and distractions. But Lord, that people can hear the word of the Lord, and they can hear it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, when it comes to the demonic, there's two questions which always arise. The first one is, where do demons come from? And then the second thing that they want to know is, what kind of creatures are demonic spirits? What kind of creatures are they? Well, they're disembodied spirits. That's what they are. And they're looking for a home. You need to know several things about demonic spirits. They are disembodied. They have an intense craving to occupy physical bodies, but yet they will occupy the bodies of animals. Their first choice is human. The second is to inhabit an animal's body. A physical body is an unclean spirit's preference, a physical body. In Matthew, this is interesting, it says Jesus is speaking here, and he's giving, here's the one that came into our world. We knew nothing about demonic spirits till he came. Whenever he came, the reason why he started talking about these things is because only his blood is the antidote for demonic spirits. Before it was his time to come, nobody in the Old Testament could cast out spirits. They could play on harps like David did with Saul, and the spirit left him for a season, but it came back. So Jesus carried around his body the blood that he was going to shed for our redemption, and it's that blood that cleanses and washes and makes whole, but it's also the blood and the power of the Holy Spirit that evicts spirits. Jesus is speaking here, and he said, when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man or woman, he walks through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house. Let's look at this just for a minute. Notice what the Spirit says. I will return to my house. Not your body, but my house. He looks at it as his possession. He looks at it as a place that this is my territory. 
And Jesus is telling this now. Jesus is giving us revelation of this. He said, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he's come, he finds it swept, empty, garnished. And he goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than himself, more wicked than himself. He goes and gets, he gets help. He gets demonic, superior help, superior demons to himself to come in because he wants them to fortify him to be able to stay in his house. They cast him out, but he's going to get seven other superior demons than him so that he can keep his place. You might say, well, isn't that crowded? No, because Legion had 5,000 demons. How can a man have 5,000 demons? He said, our name is Legion, and Legion is the number of the Roman army. It was 5,000 in a legion. Legion had thousands of demons, and they went into the hogs and killed all the hogs. There was a big, big group of hogs. And that man was carrying all those spirits around himself. And so it says, he, he takes himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And then in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said this, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom has come nigh you. The kingdom of God, the, the authority of God, the government of God has come nigh you. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom has come. And he said, how can one enter a strong man's house? Now notice what Jesus said here. He said, he's calling the strong man that's in people, he's calling their body the strong man's house. Jesus is identifying their body as his house. And plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he'll plunder his goods. But you can't go in and do anything with that person until that strong man is first dealt with and cast out. So the first thing that we're going to look at today is the demon said, I'm going to return to my house. I was cast out, but I'm going to get some other stronger demons in myself to make sure that we're not cast out the next time. And that's why the Bible says the latter end of that person is worse than the beginning. So you don't play with demonic spirits. You may think you do. You may think you can handle it, but you're going to get swallowed up. So the next thing I want to talk about is demons have five personality traits. The first one is they have a will. <clears throat> they make decisions, and these disembodied spirits follow up with corresponding actions. Matthew 12 says, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walks through dry places, and in verse 44 says, I will return. He has a will, I will. He called out what he was going to do. A spirit called out, this is what I'm going to do. The second thing about demonic spirits is they have emotion. And it said in James 2 and 19, you believe that there is one God, thou doest well. Even the devils believe and tremble. The devils believe and tremble. Tremble is an emotional word. When people are afraid, they tremble. They had a near-death experience, they tremble. They're emotionally upset. So demons have emotions. And when confronted with the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus, demons literally tremble. And a lot of times they try to do damage before they leave the person's body. They tremble. They don't want to leave, but they have to because the blood of Jesus is stronger than their residence in that body. Number three, demonic spirits are intelligent. In Matthew, or Mark 1, 24, it says, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us before our time? I know thee who thou art. They have intelligence. The demon said, we know who you are. We know you. They have intelligence. They know things. They know things. I could get off on a trail right here, but I'm not going to, but I could really get off on a trail right here and talk for 30 minutes. But I'm not going to do that because I've got too much ground to cover. Thou holy one of God. And the next thing is they are self-aware. When Jesus asked the evil spirit, what is your name? The, de the demon knew its name. The demon didn't give the name of the person he was possessing. 
The demon gave his name. He's aware of who he is. My name is Legion. He said, my name is Legion for we are many. Isn't it interesting? And I'll talk about this. Let me, let me move on. Number five, in the Gospels we see examples where demonic spirits were able to use vocal cords of human beings. They could actually use people's vocal cords. And this spirit answered Jesus with the man's vocal cords. They vibrated. They had the ability to take that man's voice and respond to Jesus. The speaking is always a distinctive trait of a personality. So these demon spirits, number one, they have a will, they have emotions, they have intellect, they are self-aware, and they have an ability to speak. Now let's talk about how Jesus handled demonic encounters. I want to go into Mark 1. We're going to take a little bit of time in, in Mark 1 today. I, I just saw some great stuff here yesterday, and I want to talk about this. It says... This is right off the bat. Now, this is Mark 1. This is Mark writing his gospel right off the bat. We're only in verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue, Jesus did, went into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And so... There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked the man, and, or he rebuked the spirit, rather, and he said, Hold your peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. Who is this guy? And immediately his fame... When he did that, his fame spread. Now, I want to just stop right there for a minute. Why would a man's fame spread by casting out a devil if people wasn't tormented with demons and wanted to get free too? If nobody had demonic trouble, it would have never registered on the Richter scale. Why did his fame spread? Because here's a man that can talk to spirits and they knew that spirits had been troubling them. And so here's what happened. They said, even with uh, um, authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately the fame of him spread throughout all the region round about Galilee. And from that time on, now we're in Mark chapter 1. Let's just stay there just for a minute. From that time on, Jesus had to deal with unclean spirits constantly. Wherever he went during his ministry, he dealt with them. Matter of fact, Herod was threatening Jesus, and I love this scripture. I like Jesus' spunk. Herod was threatening Jesus in Luke 13 and 31 in the NIV. It said, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said, you go tell that fox. I'll keep driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow and on the third day, I'll reach my goal. I'll be perfected. Now, what he was saying is, I know Herod would like to kill me, and the reason he'd like to kill me is because I'm upsetting the apple cart. I'm casting out demons. Nobody gets upset if you're healing the sick, but when you're casting out demons, it upsets the apple cart. And he said, go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I'll be perfected. Now that, if you look that up, the Bible says one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. He was actually speaking prophetically and said, you go tell that old fox that for 2,000 years, we're going to keep casting out devils and healing the sick. And on the third day in the millennium, I'll be perfected. 
So I want you to notice this now. This is very important. I want you to really think about this. Let's not let this get away from us. Let's digest it. Jesus never sent anybody out to preach. Never, not one time. Without specifically instructing them to take action against demonic spirits in the same way that he did. Throughout the New Testament, all ministry included deliverance of those vexed by unclean spirits. I mean all of them. In Matthew 12 and 28, Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom has come nigh you. So now we're still, in, we're still dealing with this thing about the demonic. So here's Jesus just now beginning his ministry. You had Moses and you had the prophets and all those were powerful men you had powerful people that, you re that we read about all throughout the, New the Old Testament. And they were able to do miracles. They were able to even raise the dead. They prophesied things and they came to pass. There was just a few instances where there was evil spirits that was tormenting people, but they could only be dealt with in a surface way. Like when David played the harp, the stringed harp with his fingers, the spirit would leave Saul for a while but come back to him. He couldn't take that worship. But when Jesus came, it was altogether different. He was the manifest Son of God. And he said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom has come. Now the government of God has come into the earth. And so Jesus was saying, I'm introducing you to a kingdom of power and authority greater than Satan's. Now, when the devil heard him say that, the battle was on. It was a crossing of the swords. It was then on because the devil made up his mind he was going to eliminate Jesus. So, if you look at today's world, especially in the past, ministry to the demonic has been greatly abused. Greatly abused. People would yell at demons and they would scream and they would holler and they would frown the forehead and they would march around and they would be demonstrative and you're coming out. And all that is dramatics. I think a lot of times people resort to dramatics when they don't have the power. If you have the power, you don't even have to lift your voice. Jesus just casually said, hold your peace and come out of him. You know? He had the power to do it. But when people had physical or emotional or spiritual problems, they had demonic spirits, and Jesus dealt with them. But if we deal with them in a way that different than Jesus dealt with them, it becomes dangerous, and it brings a reproach on the ministry of casting out demons, and then people don't want nothing to do with it. And it's a very crucial, very important thing that we must not let get by us. But because it's been so abused and because it's been so mishandled and being dealt with in such an emotional, super spiritual way, it's turned people off and they don't want nothing to do with it. And the devil has had a heyday for the last number of decades. But the day's changing. God is about to rise up and the church is about to rise up and we're saying we're not going to put up with it anymore. Somebody shout amen. amen. And I want to show you something about Jesus, how he dealt with the demonic people. Now the Bible says a certain woman which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. Now I want to just talk about this for a minute. Mary Magdalene, if you'll read about her later, she was part of Jesus' inner circle. Peter, James, John, Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, she was right in there with, with the name brands. And when Jesus met her, she had demons. Well, I want to ask you a question. If demons mess a person up, why would Jesus hang around somebody messed up? You cast the messed up part out and you keep the best part. Amen? Come on now. 
And evidently, evidently, she had been delivered somehow, and that spirit came back and brought seven more with it because it said she was delivered. Look at it one more time. Of whom out went seven demons, seven devils. So she was really bound. But here's the thing that I want everybody to understand here. When you see somebody demonic, or when you see somebody that you think is demonic, you have a tendency to look at them like they're inferior and they're evil and they're all there and all there. But by the time Jesus gets through with them, they're normal. They're normal. And here's what he said. I have come to preach deliverance to the captives. I want to set the captives free. He loves people. When are we going to understand that Jesus loves people and when's the church going to understand we've got to love people like Jesus loved people? He loved the demon possessed. And after he cast the, the 5,000 demons out of Legion, and, and Jesus got ready to leave now, he's getting ready to get on the boat and leave Gadara, like I told you last week. Here comes this guy. Now he's clothed in his right mind, looking good, got his hair combed, he's shaved, got his teeth brushed. And when, he, when Jesus is getting ready to get on the boat, he comes up and he said, Jesus, he can talk now, see? He couldn't even talk before he was insane, living in the graveyard. I wonder how many people's in the insane asylum that if they could just meet Jesus, they'd leave the insane asylum. Come on now, help me, church. And he said to Jesus, he said, Jesus, can I go with you? Oh my God, what a touching story. Here's this man that everybody was scared of, and now he's just like a little lamb. Can I go with you, Jesus? And Jesus turned to him real sweetly. He says, son, you know what? Your ministry is here. Everybody knows you. You've been the terror of the graveyard, man. And look what I've done for you. And you stay here and tell everybody, show them what I've done for you. You can have more of an effect here than you can by going with me. See how sweet that was? And now here's Mary Magdalene. He cast seven devils out of her, and she's in Jesus' inner circle. Here's what I'm trying to say. When you look around today and you see people like that, that the devil's using, try not to look at them with those eyes. Try to look at them, what could happen to them if Jesus could touch them? Or if I could get to them and lay hands on them? What could happen to them if the Holy Spirit could touch them and deliver them of those demons? They'd be altogether different. They may make a preacher. They may make an evangelist. They may make a great businessman, but right now they're bound. Thank God Jesus came and cast out devils. Somebody give him praise today. So let's go back to Mark chapter 1. Now this is interesting to me. They went into Capernaum. I'm going to read it again because I'm going to talk about it. And straightway on the Sabbath day, Jesus entered into the synagogue. That was the church of the Jews, for lack of a better way to put it. They were, Judaism, they were in Judaism, and they were in the synagogue. He taught. Jesus went in the synagogue to teach. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught his one having authority. And the Bible says there was one in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, now, I want to ask this question. Did this man come off the streets and follow Jesus into the synagogue and those demons wanted to torment Jesus while he was up preaching, trying to interrupt him? I wonder if it could have been possible that he was at the synagogue every Sabbath <laughs> and those things didn't manifest in church until Jesus came to show people they need to be delivered. Wonder if that wasn't this man's church, so to speak. Wonder if he wasn't there every Sabbath, going to church every Sabbath. And they said, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, let us alone. So it says here, and I want you to look at this with me too. This is important. In the New King James Version, it says there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out. I'm looking at Mark 1.23 in the New King James Version. This man was under the influence. Now, everybody say that out loud with me. This man was under the influence 
of an unclean spirit. In the Greek, it literally means an unclean spirit. But in the NIV, another version, it says it completely different, and this I disagree with 100%. Because a lot of times it depends on the versions that you read, whether it's really coming originally from the Hebrew or the Greek. Look what this one said. There was a man in their synagogue that was possessed. Let's back up a minute. The Greek says in the in New King James Version with an unclean spirit. Look at it again in the NIV. There was a man in the synagogue who was possessed. Now let me just stop right there and say it to you again. I don't believe in so many cases. Just hear me out that there's many people that's actually possessed by a spirit as much as they are influenced by an unclean spirit. Now, it's possible they could be possessed. I do believe in demon possession. But I'm saying I think a lot of times we're getting caught up on semantics. So there's seven things I want to talk to you about real quickly about Mark 1. Jesus was preaching a message. The way all this happened, Mark 1, we're still in Mark 1, verse 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now the gospel of the kingdom means there was a kingdom of Satan already set up. And so when Jesus came, he brought the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Now, what was the message? The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus had to demonstrate the superiority. He was put in a position that if he's going to preach the kingdom, he's put in a position he's got to demonstrate the superiority of the gospel of the kingdom of God over the kingdom of Satan. He's got to demonstrate it. You see, one of the things today about modern day church, they don't have to demonstrate a cotton picking thing. Nothing. So the first thing is, Jesus was preaching a message. The second thing is, Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, but he did not rebuke the man. The evil spirit spoke out of the man. Jesus spoke to the spirit. He commanded that spirit to be muzzled. Where he said, be quiet. It really comes in the original. It said, be muzzled. Hold your peace and come out of the man. And number three, Jesus expelled the demon from the man, but he didn't expel the man from the synagogue. I said, Jesus expelled the demon from the man, but he didn't expel the man from the synagogue. Why didn't he? Because he loves the man. We've got to get back to where we love people that's different. We've even got to love people that's demon possessed and not see them with the natural eyes, see them with the eyes. And when God delivers them, this may be my best friend. Come on, give God praise, church. Number four, Jesus was in no way flustered at all or embarrassed by the interruption or the disturbance. It didn't embarrass him one bit. He wasn't ashamed that was taking place in his ministry. There's churches today, and I'm sure there's ministries today that if somebody would manifest a demon in church, it would embarrass them to no end. Take that off. Edit that out. We don't want nobody to see that. Well, when Jesus, wherever, wherever he went, it happened everywhere he went. And it was so powerful that people began to come to him in droves. Why? They needed that ministry. I'd like to ask this question. Reckon how many people in America needs that ministry today? And then number five, it's interesting to notice this. Demon spirits, when they were addressed, it's interesting. In Mark chapter 1, verse 24, they said, let us alone... What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, and you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Look at those two pronouns. 
let us alone, I know who you are. So when the devil addressed Jesus, he was saying, I know who you are, but he was speaking on the behalf of us. Y'all get it? He said, I know who you are, but up top it said, let us alone. There was more in there with him than the spokesman, which is the head spirit. See, Jesus would only address the head spirit. He wouldn't address the symptoms. See what I'm saying? He wouldn't address the symptoms. He would address the head spirit. And when he addressed the head spirit, when he called the head big boy out, everything else came out with it. When the chief comes out, the Indians come out. For lack of a better way to put it. When it became known that he did this, and that he had a unique authority over demonic spirits, I was interested to follow up on Mark chapter 1. It's loaded with goodies. Loaded with goodies. Now let's, let's go back just for a minute. Okay, Mark chapter 1. Jesus came preaching the kingdom. Spirits started crying out. Jesus cast them out. Now he's in the temple. Spirit cried out. The people in the temple... The people in the synagogue said, never heard anybody like this. This man's got authority. Oh, my God, even the spirit world obeys him. And then after he delivered this man, we're still in Mark chapter 1. Now the Bible said, church is over and it's evening. Let's look at this. It's evening, and when the sun did sit, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed of devils. And look at the next verse. All the city, the whole city came out. Why did the whole city come out? Because so many people in the city had demons. When they heard what happened in church, the public said, finally, there's somebody that can help us. Watch. All the city was gathered together at the door. And then it said, he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and wouldn't suffer them to speak because they knew him. Now, wait a minute. I thought whenever we read the Bible that there was, okay, it was Legion, he had devils. Okay, Mary Magdalene had devils. And there's a few other people we read about in the scripture had devils. But wait a minute. The whole city came out. Go back to it. It said the whole city was gathered together at the door. When they heard what happened in church, the whole city came out. A great multitude came out. Now let me tell you what let me tell you how Luke recorded it in his book. Now when the sun was setting, and all they that had sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, and they knew that he was Christ. So Mark recorded it, and Luke recorded it, and they both said multitudes came out, and he cast out many devils. It was more than just Legion had a devil, or Mary Magdalene had a devil. It was, he cast many devils out, many what does that tell us? What have we missed? What have we been robbed of? What has been camouflaged? That we haven't seen these things. You know what I believe? I believe the Holy Spirit's showing these things right now because in the days to come, there's going to be such an insurgency of demonic spirits at the same time, there's going to be a release of Holy Ghost power of last day revival. That's what I believe is going to happen. Come on, give God praise. Now look at this. Mark ends his chapter. This is the first chapter of Mark. We're still there. He's ending the chapter by this. In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. 
And Simon and them that were with him followed after him. And when they found him, they said unto him, All men seek after you. And he said unto them, Let's go to the next towns, plural, that I may preach there also. And therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues. Look at this. He preached in their synagogues. Not just that one synagogue. He preached in their synagogues, plural, throughout all of Galilee and cast out devils in the synagogues. Now, listen to me. These were people that had the teachings of Moses. They had the Levitical law. They had the Levitical priesthood. They were the only people on the face of the whole earth that had anything to do with God. All other nations were Gentile heathen nations. Only the Jews had any kind of religious teachings. Jesus came to his own first. And even the ones that had religious teachings, many of them were full of the devil. And he cast devils out of many of them. Went in their synagogues, plural. And you see it. And cast out devils. So what was Jesus dealing with? I believe that many of these people that was in these synagogues worked hard all week. They took care of their families. They went to the synagogue. I believe these were normal people, respectable people, religious people. They loved Moses. They loved the Levitical teachings. I believe they really loved and worshiped God. But yet they were demonized. I'm not saying they were demon possessed. I'm saying they were demonized. And a certain spirit had gained access into areas of their personalities. And as a result, they were not in full control of their lives. So I believe in the day that we're living in right now, there's good, respectable people, God-fearing people, tithing Christians, that possibly may have areas of their personalities also that is vexed. I think it's more than possible. I would like to say this. There's a lot of Christians that's confused because they love the Lord. They even tithe. They even give to ministries in their church. They listen to me preach and other preachers, but they struggle with depression and they can't figure it out. They struggle with thoughts of suicide, and they live in fear that they're going to commit suicide. They live with uncontrollable lust. They live where they've been heterosexual all their life. Now they're battling with lesbian tendencies and homosexual tendencies. Many Christians are battling addictions. They're battling addictions of all kinds. People that really love the Lord. They're battling alcohol, and they really love God. Many are battling other things, pharmaceutical drugs. They're addicted. Something in that area of their life is vexed. You might say, Brother Kilpatrick, don't tell us this. I'm telling you this. You need to hear this. So rather than these people seeking deliverance, they go to the doctor to get pills. Let me tell you what pills will do. If a person's sick, they need a doctor and they need medication. But I would just say this, if a person is battling evil spirits, you don't need pills. You need somebody full of the anointing of the Holy Ghost to cast that thing out of you. That's what you need. People that are battling with spirits and they're vexed, they, they, they say, I just need a vacation. You can take a vacation and be vexed on the vacation. Other vices. Never before have we ever seen so many people that really love the Lord, and they're good people, but they're struggling with things. Never before has it been so easy to be vexed because of technology. Everybody has a cell phone. On that cell phone, you can see anything at the drop of a hat, anything you want to see in any setting, homosexual, bestiality, 
lesbian, whatever. You can see copulation of two males, a male and female, group sex, orgies. You can see it all. You see whatever you want to see. And when you watch it, just be aware, when you flick that phone off, you're going to be left with something that you didn't have before you looked at it. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? You probably don't want to hear it, but I'm standing here tonight, today to tell you, you really need to listen to John Kilpatrick today. And there's multiplied millions in this nation, much less the nations of the earth, that can see that stuff, and they're bound, and they become addicted, and they're vexed, and they're tormented. Never before has it ever been this easy. Used to, if you wanted to go get you a dose of pornography, you had to go to X-rated movie house and spend five or seven dollars and go in and pay and watch whatever you wanted to see. But now, your children can see it anytime they want to see it too. And you may say, well, I've got them blocked. Trust me, your kids know how to get around it. They know how. Do you see how the devil's making a bid today for people? Listen to me. Do you see today how the devil's trying to vex the whole nation? Can you see that? You might not want to hear what I'm telling you, but I'm asking you just to give me a chance to say it. After you leave here, you can spit out the bones if you don't like what you hear. When Jesus sent them out, look what it said. Matthew 10, verses 1 and 2. When he had called them, uh, his 12 disciples unto himself, he the Bible said he gave them power. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. Jesus gave them power. Matthew, come here. Luke, come here. Nathaniel, come here. Bartholomew, come here. I'm giving you power. I'm delegating this power to you, this authority to you. When you go out, don't just preach. When you go out, don't just tell about me. I'm giving you this power because there's so many needs, so many people are bound. I'm giving you power to cast out unclean spirits, cast them out. And I'm giving you power to heal the sicknesses and all manner of disease. Now, Mark gives a little bit more detail in chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And the Bible said they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Y'all come here. I'm going to give you power to cast out devils and heal all manner of diseases. Now, when you go out, I've trusted you with this power. And Mark said they went out, cast out many devils, many devils. See, you're way past now, Legion. You're way past Mary Magdalene. You're way past a few other people that you can remember in the Bible that had demons. But see, we bypassed over these stuff and synagogues, he was casting out devils. Whole cities came out and he was casting out devils out of whole cities. We've lost that. The devil hid it from us. It was prevalent, widespread. Whole towns, villages, cities, bound. And today in America, I would trust that nobody's laughing under your breath at me while I'm preaching this. If you're a young person watching at home, maybe with your parents, and they're asking you to watch this program, and you may be laughing under your breath, you're the very one that needs what I'm saying. Because the devil is trying to get his filthy hands on the inside of you to vex you and to destroy your life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And the Bible says after this, Jesus sent the 70 out by two by two. He sent the 70 out. And look what they came back and said. He appointed 70 also and sent them two by two before his face in every city where he's going to come. And the Bible said the 70 returned with joy saying, even the devils are subject to us. What Jesus was saying is, I'm just one man and there's so many people bound by spirits. I'm given the 70. Now he's got 70. He's got 12. Now he's got 70. That's 82. 
and I'm sending y'all out, and they all cast out many devils themselves. How many devils were there? Are you listening to me? Where did this come from? How come we didn't know this? I believe the Holy Spirit's bringing it out to show us if it was that way back then, what in the name of God is it like today? Philip in the book of Acts, now Jesus is gone. Now the disciples have become apostles. Now they're overseeing ministries, but now you've got an evangelist. The next day, we that were Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea and entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And Philip had great crowds for one reason, he had dramatic demonstrations of God's supernatural power in deliverance ministry. The Bible says, people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip preached. He spake, the hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, the Bible says in verse 7, unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with evil spirits. Many. See, here's now an evangelist preaching, and the crowds came. The place was packed out. And they came to see the miracles which he did. And he was doing miracles. And then whenever they came to see the miracles, the Spirit started crying out while he was preaching. And while they saw the miracles of healing and other things, the Spirit started crying out with a loud voice and came out of many that were possessed with these spirits. And many had taken, been taken with palsy and were lame and they were healed. And I'm going to be dealing with the spirit of infirmity in the next few weeks. Listen, I can't tell you this enough. I want you to be here in person when we deal with these things. I want you to be under the hearing of my voice in this house if you possibly can. I want to know that you're taking this seriously because I believe God is about to do great and mighty things. I said, I believe God is about to do great. I do believe that. If, listen, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be taking my time and preaching this. But it's like the Holy Spirit's just pulled the cover back off of this, and I'm seeing it, and I, I feel like what God's saying is, I'm about to do some mass deliverances before my coming. Oh, hallelujah. Mass deliverances. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Come on, church. Woo! Lift your voice. You may be seated. Woo! I've got to close. I'm, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff. This sounds so tepid. It sounds so unimportant. Is something that probably scores or maybe hundreds of people in this room are dealing with and maybe hundreds of people that's listening to me live streaming are dealing with. And I just want you to hear me. When I saw this, I said, God, oh Lord, Jesus, Jesus. Mark 11 and 25 and 26. And when you stand praying, the Lord said, forgive, and if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So here's the revelation. Jesus gives explanation of it. He said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him that owed him 10,000 talents. For as much as he had had not, didn't have the money to pay, his Lord commanded that he be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had in payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down, worshiped the king. Lord, have patience with me. I'll pay you everything. 
And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him of the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, Pay me what you owe. And his fellow servants fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. And he wouldn't do it. And he went and cast him into prison till he would pay all the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And they came and told the Lord, their Lord, all that was done. And this Lord, after he called him, said unto him, You wicked servant, you. I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise, Jesus said, this is Jesus speaking. So likewise, my heavenly Father will do unto you if you from your hearts don't forgive everyone, their brother, their trespasses. Do what? In verse 34, it says, they delivered him to the tormentors. Here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. Holy Spirit said to tell you that many of you look at carrying a grudge and walking in unforgiveness as something really, it feels good to carry this grudge. I'll make them pay. I'll show them. I'm not going to speak to them again. But here's what the Bible says. It said, that this man said, I, you came to me and you had a great debt and I forgave your great debt. And you went out and found somebody that owed you not near as much as I forgave you for. And I forgave you that, and, and you wouldn't forgive them of that small debt. He said, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn you over to the tormentors. The tormentors is not angels, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's demons. And the Lord said this. The Lord said this. I said, the Lord said this. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you if you do not forgive. So, this is just one thing that I'm going to be talking about you can have demonic vexation in your life and be tormented day and night because you're walking around simply with unforgiveness. And I say simply, but it's serious. Amen. Simply unforgiveness. What is torment? Torment means you can't get it off your mind. You've been tormented with it. You, you're just seeing it in technicolor. You keep hearing it, what they said. You keep hearing what they've done. You keep thinking about it. You can't get it off your mind. You can't shut your mind down. You can't sleep. You get up at night, walk the floor. You can't rest. It's torment. Why? Because you can't forgive. Won't forgive. You can forgive. You just won't forgive. Here's what the Holy Spirit said to me, and this is the reason I brought this out in this message today. Here's what the Holy Spirit said to me, and I'm just going to tell you what he said. He said, is it any wonder why I can't move in my church in these last days? He said, because most Christians are carrying grudges and unforgiveness. And he said, no wonder there's no revival. I can't send revival with unforgiveness and that kinds of thing. So you know what? I'm delivering what the Lord gave me to deliver. I'm putting it in your lap. Those of you watching me, I'm putting it in your lap. I'm telling you straight from the word. I didn't tell you any stories. I haven't been sensational. I've given you everything straight from the word. Everything. But you ought to begin with me now to realize that there was a lot more demon possession and demon vexation than just Mary Magdalene and, you know, Legion. The whole city came out. And he cast devils out of many. Doesn't say how many, but said the whole city came out. The whole city. 
Why did they come out? He had something they needed. What did he do? He cast out devils in the synagogue. Why did they come out? We've got the same problems. And I'm telling you today, I promise you, I believe I can say this with 100% surety, that there's many people, even in the house of God, that's vexed with things that has gotten a hold of them and they need to be free of it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there's seven things I want to give to you real quick, very quickly, to break free from demonic activity in your life. And as we go along in some of these services, I'm going to be praying for you. We're going to be coming out and we're going to be laying hands on many of you. And I want you to bring your family members and your friends. Listen, if you care about people, please get them here. You know I don't ever do this, friend. But if you care about your family, if you care about your neighbors, if you care about your coworkers, get them here. Let them hear what you hear. You can't explain it this good when you get with them. You can remember bits and pieces, but you can't explain it like I can or some other preacher can. Bring them. Let them hear what you're hearing. And we're going to pray for people. But right now, here are seven things that I want to bring to your attention to break free from demonic activity in your life. Number one, affirm your faith in Christ that he is your Savior. Affirm your confidence and your trust in his shed blood for your sins. Number two, humble yourself. Ask God for mercy to be completely set free. Ask him for mercy. Number three, repent of all sin. Acknowledge that you have sin to repent of. Don't give any place to the devil. Confess to the Lord your addiction. Confess to the Lord your bondage. Confess to the Lord your intrigue with occult practices. Number four, forgive everyone. Forgive them carte blanche. Total. Nothing held back. Forgive them. And if you can, go to them and ask them to forgive you, even if you have to make the first move. It's a decision to forgive everybody who's ever harmed you or wronged you. And as soon as you do, those tormentors will back away from you and you'll be free. Just as soon as you do, it'll be instant deliverance. Instant deliverance. Instant deliverance. As soon as you forgive them, totally, you'll be free completely. You'll sleep. You'll rest. Number five, sever all bad soulish relationships. People that you've been involved with on a soulish level, you haven't really severed your past with someone or a group or whatever. Do away with all articles of affection, things that maybe a former lover gave you, and you still relish that and cherish that, and you keep it, it reminds you. You received it from someone where the relationship was not right. Number six, renounce all satanic inroads and acknowledge that Satan has made inroads into your life and renounce every one of them. Number seven, be baptized in water. And we're going to have a baptismal service when this is over. We've already called and made reservations. And we're going to have a place where we're all going to gather on Sunday evenings and we're going to have a, a baptismal service. Water baptism separates you from your past. Water baptism is a public profession that you've left the old life and you made a decision to totally follow Jesus and newness of life. So let me one more time name the spirits we're going to be dealing with. The spirit of Antichrist. The Bible mentions the spirit, it calls it a spirit, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of bondage, deaf and dumb spirit, spirit of divination, spirit of error and a lying spirit, Familiar spirit, spirit of fear, 
spirit of haughtiness, spirit of heaviness, spirit of infirmity, spirit of jealousy, perverse spirit, seducing spirit, and a spirit of whoredoms. Now I want you to take your communion and stand with me, please, everybody.